Welcome to the Bio Balance Healthcast, episode number 420, The Highs and Lows of Testosterone. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Dr. Maupin and I just returned from our annual foray, sometimes semi-annual foray, to a conference of other physicians that practice age management medicine. Not all of them do hormone replacement therapy, but they do a lot of different things. They deal with peptides or uh, various and sundry new things that they're trying to learn about to say, how can we improve the general health and feeling, good feeling, of people as they age? So that getting old isn't just a sentence of misery. And one of the conversations that is a perennial conversation is what about testosterone replacement? When we talk about it, what's the best form to use? What's the best delivery method to use? And what's the proper dosage to use? And there are as many opinions as there are people. So how do you make a determination as a physician when those questions are in the wind? We we use one particular type of testosterone. Mm -hmm. We use testosterone pellets because... They are the most effective. They bring people who are very difficult to manage or even easy to manage back to health. Most effective mean best results for the fewest side effects? Yes. Best results, fewest side effects, and the healthier, it it changes the blood work into lower risk blood work. It helps LDL cholesterol. It improves insulin resistance for pre-diabetics. It helps you lose weight and gain muscle, so that's a healthier body. So you're talking about science as well as feeling. Yes. So as, as a man, I would say to you, oh, I feel sluggish or slow or my stomach hurts or mm-hmm. I just don't have any energy or sex drive or what mm-hmm. have you. Those are my feelings. And then you're looking at the blood results and the bone density mm-hmm. and, and the sugar absorption and all those other mm-hmm. scientific balance issues that right. physicians worry about. And whether I'm going to give you a bunch of estrogen, which is not necessarily good for you. Right. So if I were just looking at at just symptoms getting better, mm-hmm. I think that injections, like getting an injection every two weeks, which is a big hassle and hard to manage going into the doctor's office every two weeks, is in terms of feeling better might be almost the same as pellets, but it has a lot more side effects a lot more balding, a lot more back hair, um, higher LDL, and and in scientific terms, higher cholesterol. So it increases your risk instead of decreases your risk. It does help your bones. It does help your muscles. But it also makes that DHT level go up, makes your prostate enlarge. There's more side effects to that. Pellets in my hands don't do that. Yeah. So I choose pellets. Now, there's a lot of other kinds of testosterone that you can use, you can use gels, but gels turn into estrogen, so you you get man boobs and you get a belly fat, so you're not healthier. Years before I ever met you, I was put on testosterone cyprianate, I think was the name of it. That's the shot. It was a shot, and my wife was taught to give me the shot at home, Mm -hmm. and I think once a week she would give me a shot, Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would have like fluctuations of mood or libido. I didn't include that, sorry. (laughs) I, I, it just was really inconsistent and unpredictable. Mm-hmm. And, and my awareness or focus was just on a couple of domains. But when I met you and we began to have these conversations, listening to what you talked about of, for coverage, you mm-hmm. know, for bone density, for muscle strength, mm-hmm. for resistance to certain kind of, of illnesses that like genetically I'm exposed di- to diabetes. from my family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, it made sense to me to try to make the move from the shots to the pellets. Right. And I'm, I'm in the business of making people healthier, not feel good, not healthy. Okay. Yeah. I want to make patients healthier. So I want their LDL cholesterol to go down without statins, hopefully. Yeah. And I want their blood sugar, them to be more sensitive to insulin, not less sensitive. I don't want them to gain fat. 
I want them to gain muscle. Or have you to know, be on so, an antidepressant. Right. I don't, I'm not trying to cause more trouble, but less, and use less drugs, hopefully, mm -hmm. and make people healthier longer throughout their life and more able to take care of themselves. So my goal is different. My goal is very um, perfectionistic. <laughs> I want you to be as ha healthy, happy, quality of life, so meaning your symptoms go away, and I want you to not have to be on a lot of medicines that you might be on now. Okay. So that's so, my goal. So uh, first steps. I find your website, somebody recommends, I read your book, whatever, and I say, mm -hmm. you know what, I'm going to go talk to this doctor. So I call your office and make an appointment. You send me a recommendation for blood test. You're mm -hmm. not really going to have a conversation with me about my observation of my symptoms, my mood, you know. Not yet. Or, or my <laughs> wife and I would come in until you see my blood work. Mm -hmm. So you use basically, or most people, I don't no, know No, I look you at use. your symptoms and your blood mm -hmm. work together. Well, but what I was going to ask about is the labs. Because mm -hmm. you use certain standard national labs mm -hmm. like Quest uh, or uh, LabCorp. LabCorp. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people go to those two labs. Mm -hmm. and you use others if you need to because mm -hmm. uh, you had some people from Australia and Germany yeah. that, <laughs> that don't I, have access to those. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so then the labs send you, here's a result for this guy. He's in a normal range. How do they determine normal? What does that mean to you when, when you say, well, okay, so what's normal? Because normal for a healthy adult male according to what I read, can go from like 300 testosterone to 1,000. Well, what is normal? Well, so, that's what I want to so know. So the, th the thing, they they have chosen not to put normal on the lab test printouts anymore. <laughs> they put in range. In range. In range. Now, when a doctor looks at lab, in their mind, they're thinking, if you're in this range, and I don't really know much about that blood test, you're okay. Right. But what it really means is, if you're in that range, you're average. Now, the average male in the U.S., basically they're checking everybody from 20 to 80. Right. Doesn't The older people don't have enough testosterone. It well, drops with age. And, and I'm six foot tall and weigh 195 pounds. Mm -hmm. If I were six foot three and weigh 240 pounds, mm -hmm. normal would be different? No, it wouldn't be that. Your, your blood level would not be different necessarily. It would be you, you may have more estrogen because you have more fat. Okay. Right? So your but your testosterone level would be similar. It would not it would not be different, but how you dissolve the pellets might be. But that's a different subject. But so when I look at a blood work, I'm not looking at the the normal that's written there. I have a normal which is normal men feel good and are operational, meaning they don't have any ED. And if they are between 400 and 1500, any age, I don't put the age in so you there. you look at a range. I look at this range and there are some men that feel great at 400. Right. But another man that I get to 400 with pellets is going to be like, so where's the beef? Yeah. I don't feel it. My symptoms are still there. I still can't think. I still uh, don't, I still have ED. I still so, feel tired. Yeah. So that man's normal is different. So we were at this conference, and doctors were having these conversations with one another, mm -hmm. and that was the response that most of them were coming up with. It mm -hmm. you got a range here, and you have to find out where the guy's best return or best response is. Mm -hmm. And what most of them were saying, if I understood correctly, is that you start at a low or a baseline level, mm -hmm. and you increase in small increments mm -hmm. until you hit what they call the sweet spot, where the right. symptoms went away and the guy felt good. But that's... So but, the, so that's the minute I give anybody any testosterone, it shuts down their own production. So if I give a three a, somebody who has three hundred and lots of symptoms of low testosterone, a little bit of testosterone, it might drop him down to two hundred and he'll feel worse. Okay. So that doesn't work for pellets, uh, and it sh really doesn't work for shots. Right. It may work for gels where every week you could increase it if you had to. But, but can you then look at my normal blood test? I just come in without pellets or testosterone or anything and say, okay, you have a baseline already of 300. So I'm going to give you a 300 pellet plus. How do you decide? That I decide by talking to somebody. Okay. I, I look at all their symptoms. That, that tells me whether they have the severity of their symptoms and the type of symptoms they have. tells me if they have high estrogen, low testosterone, and... I talk to them about how much they work out, how much do they need to cover four to six months. 
I asked them about what they felt like when they were young. When I, if I look at them, they're big guys who used to have a lot of muscle and now don't. They used to have a lot of testosterone. Mm -hmm. So that tells me something. You also ask them about their stress levels, yeah. their sense of their mental acuity. Uh, how's mm -hmm. your mind functioning? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the things you need well, to those remember? Those are part of my symptoms. Words? Yeah. So I ask about the symptoms and I put that in front of me. Here's my thought. My thought is that you don't want to, it, it is cash pay to come to see me because this is not covered by insurance. They right. don't care if your hormones are okay. They haven't seen the beauty of it yet. Right. So you have to put out money to see me. So before you come to see me and put out any money, I'm going to look at your labs and your symptoms right. and say, does this man need to see me? If I look at that and find something else that your primary care can take care of and you and your testosterone's great and you don't have that many symptoms and they're not really testosterone symptoms, they could be this other issue, I send you back to your lab and say, please see your primary care with this. Because a general doctor will be but able to figure this out. you are not currently a candidate for testosterone. Yeah, they, but you don't need testosterone to make you feel better. Right. Or I find something else that must be taken care of before you get testosterone. Say you have a really high PSA. So you might have a problem with your prostate. I want that cleared up before we give you testosterone. And you don't do those exams. And I, that's, I don't do the, the blood biopsies yeah. or the exams. We usually do the the PSA to start out with, to rule something out that's right. already there. Right. But we send you to a urologist so that you can get that taken care of. We want you to be ready and ready to go out of the gate with some testosterone when we see you. So what if I'm a guy that's had prostate cancer, mm -hmm. but I have all these other issues of, of not having enough testosterone? Mm -hmm. Because of the historical concerns about hormone replacements and cancer, about testosterone, would would I be a candidate for a testosterone replacement? Depends on when you had your prostate cancer. Okay. It depends on whether it was all removed, if you've had any recurrences. So if somebody's had prostate cancer 15 years ago, they've had no recurrences and it was all removed or it was all radiated, and they've had nothing in the past 15 years and their PSA is okay, then generally, depends, it's not everybody, then I would consider giving them testosterone. Testosterone isn't the cause of prostate cancer. You have to read Abraham Morgan Taylor. He's the expert. It doesn't, testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer, but when prostate cancer occurs, the cells change and can be fed by testosterone. Okay. So, I don't want to feed a cancer that's already there, but if you don't have cancer and there's no recurrence and you've been totally treated, then I have them sign a high-risk consent knowing that this is still high risk because at one point they had prostate cancer. Right. And we don't know if anything's there, but I, I wait until they're treated for a long time or right. they're without cancer for a long time. I also, in younger people who really, I mean, in not younger people, people who have who are out maybe five years after prostate cancer and have been completely treated, right. then I ask their urologist to, to send me a, yeah, a letter saying, yeah, this guy can have testosterone. Right. And I, I get those letters periodically. Sometimes I, I get the hell no, and then we don't do it. Right. Well, it's for the patient's safety. Right. It's because for the patient's safety. You don't want to wake up the sleeping dragon. No. If, if you give them something that's going to directly feed those cells and make them mm -hmm. grow, if there are any cells there. If so there if, there's, there. if there are no prostate cancer cells there, then this isn't going to cause prostate cancer. Right. So it's kind of like breast cancer. Estrogen doesn't cause it. However, if there's already a breast cancer, those cells have changed and can be fed by estrogen sometimes if they have estrogen receptors. So we have to know what we're dealing with before we start testosterone. So we're very safe. I mean, we make sure that we've got the tests done, the They've seen their urologist or primary care for an exam before we see them. So no money <clears throat> changes hands until we know that you are a candidate but for But you this. really make a qualified assessment. For instance, you, one of the things I learned at this meeting, and, and you validated because you already mm -hmm. knew it, was that if a man has had a stroke or heart attack within the last six mm -hmm. months, you're not going to give him testosterone mm -hmm. replacement. Nope. Not unless he's, he was already on it. Mm -hmm. And... He gets a, approval by his doctor because some heart attacks. So you were talking about a case that you had where a cardiologist, a, a man had lost considerable heart function right. because of a heart attack. And he wanted to go on 
testosterone. He had already been on it. And his cardiologist said no. And yeah. And he said, but I want it. And you guys, the three of you all figured something out. Well, then out. I sent articles to the cardiologist uh -huh. about how testosterone helps mend the heart and build heart muscle back. So he, he had had a heart attack and he had had, um, a heart attack means you've actually damaged heart muscle. Okay. So he had had his vessels stinted. So there was now good blood flow to, to okay. the heart muscle, but much of that heart muscle was dead mm. so or dying. So I sent him the articles that show that testosterone helps heal the heart after damage to the muscle. So his vessels were clear and his muscle was dying. So his, his doctor finally conceded and let me give it to him and then said, this guy recovered his heart. His heart came back meaning his ejection fraction. That means the amount of blood you can pump with that muscle came back to normal. Wow. So he was impressed. The cardiology was impressed. The patient's And, and the only differential treatment was the addition of testosterone. Right. In so, in and that's what's fascinating form. at these conferences. You, you hear doctors sitting around in groups say, having this conversation. Well, I had a patient that had this. And, mm -hmm. well, what did you do? And why did, what happened? And what was the follow-up? And that's how they learn. I can tell you that if I had a heart attack yeah. and I had stints placed, yeah. I would remain on testosterone. Yeah. Because otherwise, I don't think I'd heal. You, testosterone you've seen the helps you heal. Yeah. And it helps you heal for surgery. A lot of people before orthopedic surgery, we bump up their testosterone a little bit so that they can actually heal the uh, bone, muscle, and joints before, you know, when they, after their surgery. So that's a common thing for our patients. They say, oh, I'm going in for surgery for blank. Yeah. And so we give them a little extra testosterone so they can heal better. If there's somebody with a head injury, we look at their growth hormone because you need growth hormone to heal as well. And sometimes we use what's called peptides, but that's another story on another day. But we use peptides to stimulate growth hormone so that they'll heal during that time. It's not growth hormone. It doesn't have the same side effects, but it does help stimulate their own growth hormone. Oh, new word I learned, secretagogues. Secretagogues, that's yeah. right. It makes your pituitary secrete growth hormone. Yeah, so but it's not actually giving you growth hormone because right. the FDA, FDA has issues about that. So the last thing on, you know, on the subject of levels and doses of testosterone or the last two things, everybody's got that level that they have to get to to wipe out their symptoms and to make them feel whole again, like they right. used to. We're not making you feel like Superman if you never felt like Superman before. We want you to feel like your old self yeah. when you were a little younger. And we also need to consider that it's not just the level that we're feeding your cells with, it's your receptor sites. Some people have very sensitive receptor sites, so they don't need as much blood level. And then some people have really... They're, they're really tough receptor sites. They need to be flooded with testosterone just to feel better. And so those are resistant, so we need to give more. So it's not really, it's not always if you're a big guy or a little guy, it's your genetics on how your receptor sites deal with testosterone. So, and it's, so it's not always blood level, but it, it is free testosterone level plus your genetics. And that's the art part. Well, and that's a distinction that you learn to make, too. It, it, a lot of the articles that you read talk about testosterone, and they just say testosterone as if it's a single ingredient. Mm -hmm. But what the functional part of the replacement testosterone that we're trying to, to uh, have an impact with is what's called free testosterone, not and total testosterone. Total testosterone is just all of the storage the testosterone it tells me, I, I draw it for men because I want to know if you're really making it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, but really, if your free testosterone is low and you're still making testosterone, you probably still need testosterone or you need something else to get your free testosterone up. Well, and by free testosterone, we're talking about how much is available in the system for use by these receptor sites. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that can be measured. And there is a number that you want to achieve mm -hmm. for people so that they are healthier and have symptom reduction. The, um, the number that w I was trained with is 129 picograms per milliliter or 12.9 nanograms per deciliter. Of free. Of free testosterone. That's what you need to, that's what the lowest level is for you to feel normal. Now that is not just out there on your lab sheet or anything else. They have a very low free testosterone that they consider normal. I think... <sighs> It's just 
that there's so many people with low testosterone and they test everybody and they don't say, are you well? Do you have these symptoms? They just say, are you male? And they test your blood. And then they say, this is normal. Well, the nor testosterone is getting lower and lower over time because we have so many of these estrogens uh, in plastics that are in our environment and they, they and we're discussing counteract that the testosterone. The meeting as well. yeah. So the, the whole level of testosterone, I only know in the United States, I don't know about Europe, is going down going down that doesn't mean it's normal to be down it just means it's average so the, we're looking at the mean normal, the mode, the median. healthy men and what their testosterone is and right. that's why i have to write in my normals meaning what is the lowest number that you have to be to be functional and and that's the number i put in there yeah and that's what i'm looking for and and then from that lowest possible level you're looking for the sweet spot where they feel really good right. and the symptoms are all gone. Right. So one is just to qualify to say, yeah, you need some testosterone. Right. The other is to see where you feel the best. Right. So it's, it's a different number I'm looking for. Everybody's got their own number. All right. And if you have our number, you'll be back next week for our next uh, continuing conversation. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.